All right. Thank you again for joining me to begin this virtual exploration of Uganda with Classic Africa Safaris. My name is Tad Bradley with the Cusini Collection. We are the North American sales and marketing representatives for Classic in uh, North America, in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, we're going to explore just Uganda today. However, Classic also has uh, is a ground operator in Rwanda as well. If you do have questions, uh, you can go ahead and type those into the question tab on your uh, control panel there. I will probably not answer questions until the end of the presentation. We'll probably go about 45 minutes to an hour or so. Um, and if uh, if I get long, I will I will be happy to answer questions via email uh, after the presentation. So go ahead and, and ask any questions, and I will get to those as soon as possible. If you have any issues with <clears throat> seeing the screen or they're all hearing me, also please go ahead and uh, uh, type that into the question tab, and I'll try to remedy anything. But I think we're all good. So again. My name is Tad Bradley with Cusini Collection. Classic Africa Safaris uh, is a ground operator based in Entebbe, Uganda, but they do operate both in Uganda as well as in Rwanda. They were founded back in 2001 uh, by partners Mel Gormley and Phil Ward, who are longtime veterans of the East Africa safari industry, and they have something like 75 combined years of experience in African travel, so they definitely know this business extraordinarily well. Classic is a small team, a hands-on company. They are travel trade focused. Uh, they do not market to the consumer. They really are committed 100% to developing long-term relationships with the trade. So they are, uh, they are always committed to working with the travel trade and to growing, helping to grow your business in Uganda. An important distinction as well for, for Classic is they are a ground operator. Uh, they work with a wide variety of properties, uh, of camps and different lodges, and this really allows us to design an itinerary that is the best fit for your clients. And Classic employs some extraordinarily talented and experienced guides. They are all on staff. They're on staff guides, and they have uh, years of experience both uh, in wildlife conservation uh, as well as in uh, just handling groups and, and, and dynamic of group management. Uh, I was had the pleasure of traveling with Edward, one of Classic Guides, and he's one of the best, most sensitive and most thoughtful guides I've ever had the pleasure of, of traveling with throughout the world. He was a pleasure to be with for, for 10 days. Uh, he's just a wonderful guide as well as a wonderful human being. And I can't say enough about his professionalism, his knowledge, of the country, the history, as well as the flora and the fauna, his character and, and his dry sense of humor. Guides are really important in Uganda. It's a driving destination, um, a driving safari destination. So you do spend a lot of time with your guide, and it, your guide is with you throughout the experience. So having guides with deep knowledge and great personality is, uh, is really important. Another important distinction with Classic, uh, or important factor with Classic, is that they operate their own vehicle fabrication and service shop. So again, as a driving destination, vehicles are critically important. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but they actually custom build all of their vehicles and, uh, and service them in, intensely after each and every safari. So I returned from Uganda about two weeks ago, and um, I think I'm still on a, a bit of a high from the destination. Um, it absolutely blew away my sky-high expectations. Uh, I actually was excited about Uganda, not necessarily because of the primates, the gorillas, but I love the mountains, and I was really excited to experience the Renzoris, the mountains of the moon, as well as see the Virunga volcanoes. Um, and the destination, certainly for the mountains and the landscapes, absolutely exceeded my expectations. But the wildlife experience and the cultural experience also was um, was far more than I than I could have imagined. So moving on, just to give you a, a bit of a context, I think we're all familiar with East Africa safari landscape. Um, tuning into Uganda, the large majority of the travelers that are 
going to be visiting Uganda are experiencing and traveling to the western part of the country, to that Albertine Rift Valley right along the border with the Congo, where those mountains, the Renzori's and the Barunga volcanoes are. Your traditional safari circuit, if you can see my mouse here, is Murchison Falls down to the Kampali National Forest, the Fort Portal area, Queen Elizabeth National Park, and of course the gorillas down in Windy Impenetrable Forest. There are other uh, great spots to visit throughout the country, Kadepo Valley up in the north, uh, a far lesser visited destination, um, beautiful open plains and savannas, uh, incredible unique culture as well. Some place that does require a little bit more time, however, because of the time to get there and, and or cost because of the flights required. So we're going to focus largely on this Western Circuit today um, and um, and take you basically through what a what a typical circuit would look like with Classic. A few more bits of information: Kampala is the capital of Uganda. Uh, 1.2 million people out of 36 million. English is widely spoken. Uh, there are also 33 indigenous languages. Uh, Entebbe International is your point of entry. It is only 35, 40 kilometers from Kampala, but don't let that fool you. Um, it can be up to a two and a half hour drive from Entebbe to, uh, to Kampala, the capital itself, due to the horrendous traffic that exists in the city. Um, all of the big names, really, British, Emirates, KLM, South African, uh, Kenya Airways fly into uh, Entebbe. I flew KLM via Amsterdam. Seattle has a direct flight from here to Amsterdam, and after a short layover, uh, continued onward to Entebbe. I think about three times a week that KLM flight is direct from Amsterdam to Entebbe, and the other four times a week it makes a brief stop in Kigali in Rwanda just next door and you don't have to change planes. So it's a nice option. It does get in in the, eve or in the, in the late evening, 9 o'clock, or actually about 10 o'clock. So it does make for an early start the next morning. Um, but, uh, but that single transfer in Amsterdam is wonderful. Visas are required. They can be easily purchased on, on arrival, $50. Um, of course, crisp bills post-2006, same as just about everywhere else. In Africa, yellow fever certificates required, although not often, not always checked, um, and passports require a one-year validity after your departure date from the country. Uh, credit cards and ATM machines are not widely um, used or accessible, um, so bringing U.S. cash is really recommended, and then um, changing money um, or or providing tips in. Uh, in U.S. dollars. Notes, as I said, must be dated after 2006. The newer bills, crisper the better, of course. A traveler's checks really not an option any longer. And quickly, health information, yellow fever certificate is uh, required for entry, but uh, I wasn't checked upon entry, um, so it may or may not be checked, but it's still something that your, your clients will need to have. Malaria is present in Uganda um, in varying levels. It's not a, a super high risk uh, country, but taking prophylactics is definitely recommended and, and a small price to pay. And of course, travelers should always consult a doctor, a travel doctor, and, and the CDC website. Um, just a quick, because it is in the news, although thank goodness a lot less these days, uh, Uganda has had very small outbreaks of Ebola in the past not during this large outbreak currently that's this, uh, centered in West and only in West Africa. Um, they were scanning for temperature. All passengers upon arrival were, were given a temporal temperature scan. Um, Uganda is very, very well equipped to manage any sort of outbreak should the, the worst happen. They have done it before and, and they, are, um, they are in a great position to do it again. So. Quickly, uh, weather and season, it's an equatorial co uh, country, so your temperatures are, are fairly consistent. It's more about whether it's wet or dry. Um, currently, December through February, it's the, the dry, warm part of um, the year with spring-like conditions. It's great for gorilla trekking. Uh, March, you get some occasional rains here and there. It's still great game viewing. The, the plains green up a little bit. April and May is when the heavier rains occur. It's, it's along with November are the times of year where gorilla permits are generally discounted. 
because of these rains and trekking can be a little bit more difficult uh, due to the conditions on the ground, a little bit more muddy and slippery. And then June through October is the cooler dry season. It also corresponds, of course, with the peak tourist season, which again in Uganda doesn't mean uh, hordes and hordes of vehicles. That's one thing to keep in mind. This is a, a wonderfully um, lesser known and lesser travel destination in terms of uh, having exclusivity around when you're game driving and when you're when you're out uh, um, experiencing the wildlife, you really are usually the one of only a few vehicles, one or two, oftentimes just one. Um, so even in peak tourism season, it is not crowded by any means. And then November, uh, which is when I was there, is uh, occasional showers. We had a few nights that were, um, you know, big thunderstorms, lots and lots of rain. Um, it didn't rain all that often during the day. I think a better, uh, a more important thing to note with the rain at night is, um, first, it makes sleeping great, um, but it also does impact the roads. So the weather, the rain can impact um, not so much your activities, you can still game drive, but it's more about the conditions on the road. And again, of course, um, gorilla trekking, that can be a little bit more muddy, and we did experience that. So those are some things to keep in mind uh, regarding the weather. So. Why Uganda? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but one of them, as I just said, far fewer people. Um, but it really is, and I was, um, you know, Uganda has been Lindsay's purview for the past several years, so I'm really excited that I finally got the opportunity to visit, and, and, and it absolutely delivered in terms of its diversity, and it's, it's a very dynamic place, both from a wildlife perspective, beyond the primates, landscape perspective, and a cultural perspective. Uh, it's really... A, a complete travel experience beyond the safari even. It really has a lot of elements that make it very uh, dynamic and diverse and unique. There's a, a wide variety of activities for visitors to, to uh, experience. Of course, gorilla and ship trekking are um, what most people travel to Uganda for, but for active travelers, you've got incredible forest hikes. There's the Murchison Fall waterfalls and other smaller waterfalls throughout the country. Uh, you can trek through Bwindi beyond gorilla trekking. There are several, you know, four to six hour treks through the national forest, which are extraordinarily beautiful. And then you have your driving safaris, uh, Murchison Falls, Queen Elizabeth National Park being the two um, that are the most prominent parks for game viewing. But just about anywhere, um, well, certainly in Murchison and in Queen Elizabeth, you complement your driving safaris with boating safaris as well. And because of uh, the rivers and the channels that uh, bisect Murchison Falls and Queen Elizabeth National Park, you have incredible birding. And as I mentioned, cultural experiences in particular, the Batwa experience in the Bahama region of Bwindi, fewer travelers, intimate game viewing experiences because there are so many, so few vehicles, the culture is incredibly rich and the accommodations are very authentic, very real feeling. This is not a luxury safari destination. Another thing to, to, uh, to say right off the bat, keep that in mind. Um, but the accommodations are very unique, uh, and, they're, and they've gotten, with the new additions in recent years, they've gotten better and better and are incredibly comfortable. And guides, the guides, as I said, are tremendous. And the charter flights, are the scheduled charter flights that began a couple of years ago, have now allowed for those that are concerned about the driving um, or that don't have as much time to experience the, you know, the wonders of Uganda without spending quite as much time in a vehicle. So starting in Entebbe, um, we recommend that passengers, uh, guests stay in Entebbe versus going into Kampala. Um, as I said, the traffic is, is a major factor, and there are several really great um, properties very close to the airport. Um, we typically recommend um, two of them, the Karibu Guest House, um, which is about a 10-minute drive from the airport, and the Protea Hotel. There is also the Lake Victoria Hotel, which is a classic older property. But these two are excellent, and they really kind of fit any, any guests that you may have. Makribu is a wonderful homey bed and breakfast. Um, it's tucked into a leafy hillside above Lake Victoria. Seven rooms. There's the cottage rooms on the left, which are newer, slightly nicer baths. Uh, and then four rooms in the main house. Uh, they have wonderful gardens and a view overlooking the uh, overlooking the lake, and the food is tremendous. 
Um, it's great for those clients that are repeat Africa travelers, mid-level travelers, um, or for those who really prefer homey, boutique, bed and breakfast style accommodation. Um, I really personally loved it. Um, I think it, that's, that fits me as a traveler, um, that kind of homey, boutique -y style. But the Protea, you know, it's a typical Protea, except that it has this tremendous location right on Lake Victoria, on, the, on a beach on Lake Victoria. Um, so it's a, you know, beautiful location. Um, and it's literally a five-minute drive from the airport to, uh, to the hotel. So it's, it's a, you know, you can walk <laughs> from your gate to the Protea. And for an overnight, it's, it's perfectly um, wonderful, acceptable, beyond acceptable. It's a great, it's a great option. Um, for those that must stay in, in Kampala, if they're staying for a few more days, there's a Serena there that's, that's a Serena and, very, and just fine. And then the Amin Pasha is the luxury boutique hotel. Um, but again, if you can avoid going into Kampala, it's, it's recommended. As you can see on the map here, heading up to Murchison Falls, um, if, bef before we get to Murchison, if you're going from Entebbe to Fort Portal in the Kabali area to do chimp trekking, that's where you're going to begin your safari, which is a common thing to begin in Kabali. You can really avoid Kampala entirely um, and skirt the, uh, skirt the outskirts of, of the city, um, which saves you quite a bit of time. Going to Murchison, there is a ring road around Kampala that you can take that does, um, that does help you avoid some of the traffic. Um, but it is, uh, it's still unavoidable to, that you'll have to travel through a bit of Kampala to get up to Murchison. Um, the road is paved up to Murchison Falls, um, and it takes, you know, three to four hours to get to Masindi, and then another couple of hours into the park where you're on, uh, you're off to a paved, you're on unpaved roads, but you're traveling through um, the beautiful Budongo Forest, which is um, home to one of the largest chimp populations in Uganda, and you can do chimp trekking in Murchison, although we tend to recommend Kabali, uh, but it's, it's a beautiful drive into the national park through this incredibly verdant forest. You feel like you're in a tunnel of green. Um, it's a spectacular spot, and this is what people are generally coming to Murchison for, to see the falls, but it's, it's a top birding destination in Uganda. Um, it's you know, thanks to the Nile River and the Nile River Delta, the birding here is tremendous. The chimp trekking, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's good for chimp trekking. Um, it is a little bit of a longer drive to get from our preferred accommodations along the Nile River to the chimp trekking area, uh, but it is possible to, to chimp trek there. Lots of other primates as well, and then, of course, uh, the falls. This is a map of the, the center, really, of Murchison, where the most of the lodging are, are located along the Nile River. As you can see, the Victoria Nile bisects Murchison Falls. Uh, to the north is, is where most of the game drives are done in that Uligi area. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, you have the Shoebill uh, habitat in the Nile Delta. Um, uh, along with birding and the, the primates in Murchison, there's really excellent game viewing in that area north of the Nile River. There are beautiful, large open plains. Um, there are large herds of elephants, buffalo. The Rothschild giraffe are located here, one of only two areas in, in Uganda where you will see giraffe, and a good number of lion, uh, a large variety of antelope as well. The Nile boasts one of the largest populations of hippos in Uganda, as well as huge, dense populations of crocodiles, massive crops like the six. 100 kilogram beast that we came upon on our travels there with the, the teeth to boot. And then, of course, the birding and the shoe building, the largest um, uh, attraction in, for birds in Uganda. Um, there are two cruises on the Nile, one that goes downstream to the delta, which is where you find the shoe bill, uh, as well as a, a dazzling variety of other birds. And then you have the upstream cruise that goes toward Murchison Falls, also great for birding. You can do a full day birding tour down through the delta. Um, for, you know, for serious birders, this is definitely something that is recommended. So this is the cruise, the, the, the style of boats. Um, we, we avoid the large double-decker booze cruise style um, boats, as you can see in the, in the photo on the top. Uh, we prefer and, and generally 
um, unless otherwise noted, utilize the, the smaller boats and oftentimes just private private uh, cruises as well. Um, regardless of whether you're going to the Nile to try to see the shoe bill or not, um, this, the river is a birder's paradise. Um, the, the, the delta itself is full of these papyrus islands, lots of channels. It feels very wild and untouched. There are no other lodges in that area down toward the delta. And so you really do feel like you're out um, truly in the wilds of Africa. Um, and you do, during, during the dry months, there are large um, groupings of elephants and buffalo, giraffe even, that do come down to the water's edge to drink. Heading up toward Murchison Falls, to the falls themselves, it's also a birding bonanza, also a lot of uh, larger um, game. We saw bushbuck, waterbuck, several very large monitor lizards, herds of uh, bachelor, herds of buffaloes, and of course lots of hippos and crocs. Um, and then you get close to the falls and the velocity of that water coming through that narrow gap is, is, uh, is incredible to witness. It's a really the raw power of nature is definitely on display. This is the top of the falls, which can either be accessed by a vehicle or from where the cruise stops below the falls. You can actually hike up, uh, about an hour hike up to the top of the falls. And it's just, again, the tremendous raw power of the fall, this thunderous uh, sound of the Nile being squeezed into a gap about 25 feet wide um, and then exploding down 140 feet down to the Nile below. Um, there are something like 340 cubic meters of water cascades down the falls per second. And unlike Victoria Falls or Niagara Falls for that matter, when you get to the car park at Murchison, there are no vendors selling curios and knickknacks. Um, there's a park ranger, maybe another vehicle or two, but it's really refreshingly unspoiled. It's not uh, being commercialized in the least bit. That's the view from the top of the falls down toward the Nile below. So a couple of the accommodations. We recommend two and now a third is coming online. The Nile Safari Lodge, six tents and six wooden chalets on the river. Uh, it's, on, it's just outside the park on community land and a private concessions. The tents are basic, but probably your best bet. I prefer those over the wooden uh, cabana or wooden chalets. Um, they have outdoors, the tents have outdoor bucket showers. Um, all of the showers as well as the, the cabins are bucket showers, so keep that in mind. It's got a beautiful elevated location, as you can see from this photo. Very atmospheric main lodge with a fire pit and several view decks. It's really a cozy feel, and you watch the sunset over the Nile toward the, the delta. It's, it's spectacular. They have a great pool as well with views overlooking the Nile River. I think it's best for adventurous mid-level packs, um, and tents are definitely your best bet. There's a new property, which you'll see in a minute, Baker's coming online, which is going to give the Nile Safari Lodge a run for their money. Uh, Para Lodge, original Safari Lodge, built in 1954. It's your traditional larger safari lodge, 54 rooms. The main lodge is very spacious, though, with lots of places to sit, um, so it never really feels overly crowded. It does have a very colonial feel, which is either um, charming or off-putting, but I think for the par lodge, it's generally mostly charming, and the staff was wonderful. The food was good. All the rooms overlook either the pool with the river beyond or a large grassy knoll with the river beyond, and the pool area has a swim-up bar. So. Who doesn't like a, a swim-up bar? <laughs> they do have a few tents, which I would avoid. If you want tented accommodations, go to the Nile Safari Lodge. Then there's a Queen's Cottage, which is great for families. It's a standalone, small, private home, has air conditioning, so something to, uh, to look at if you have a family group. And Baker's is opening up um, in actually right about now. They're going to have six riverside cottages. Um, they're, um, they're, they're stone and thatched chalets. They have a screened open front. And they all look out over the river. Uh, I think this will be a great option uh, in Murchison Falls, maybe the best option, certainly for those looking for a more traditional or more um, adventurous um, oriented feel. And I think, again, the Nile Safari Lodge will really have to up their game with this now coming online. There will eventually be 10 um, is the goal, I think, so keep, that, keep Bakers in mind for, for future safaris beginning um, in the new year. 
So a couple of things about what's different for Classic and Murchison. Private boat launches, as I said, unless otherwise discussed, unlimited game drives and, and, and distances. So we can spend a full day on safari in Murchison Falls with a picnic lunch in the middle, um, and there's no limit on that. Really exploring as far and as much as you want during the during that uh, that day. And the Delta full day tour is great for for the birders for shoe bill spotting. And remember that accommodations in Murchison are, are generally more basic, uh, more as I said, tented accommodations at Nile Safari Lodge or your larger, more traditional safari lodge like uh, Para. There's the beautiful East African savannas, you have giraffes, there's a wide variety of activities, and then you have the shoe bill. So for birders, Murchison is definitely a must. If you're staying at Para Lodge, you're on the north side of the, of the river, uh, and so you need to cross back uh, to head down from Murchison Falls to the Kabali area. It's, you're crossing on, on a ferry, which is really more of a, a barge, fits about eight to ten vehicles, and only the drivers stay in the vehicle. Passengers must get out. So something to keep your clients aware of. They're going to have to get out. Very African experience, but it's a beautiful um, crossing, especially during the morning um, or the afternoon when the sun is setting. There are crossings every two hours, so one to two hours. So you have to keep on that schedule. And, and we, uh, if you're leaving to drive to Fort Portal um, to the Kabali area, uh, you're going to have to take that early ferry, that 7 a.m. ferry, and, and continue on. It is a full day drive going from Murchison Falls down to the Kabali Fort Portal area. However, this drive reinforced a couple things for me. One, Uganda is definitely very densely populated, um, and it's absolutely extraordinarily beautiful. And we really haven't even reached the mountains yet at this point. But it's a cultural experience because it's a driving experience, and you're driving through you know, populated areas, you have cultural experiences um, on the fly, and, and you're always seeing people. The Ugandans are incredibly beautiful people, very welcoming. Um, you get lots of smiles and waves, uh, and it, it just feels like a safari destination that is still very much um, excited about the, the tourism that is coming into their country. Because it's a driving destination, vehicles are critically important. As I said, Classic maintains their own vehicle fabrication and service shop. So they're actually custom building their vehicles for optimum comfort for guests as well as for uh, reliability. All their vehicles have comfortable bucket seats, uh, either five-seaters or seven-seaters, uh, large windows and pop tops for game viewing. They come equipped with a cooler box full of water and drinks. Um, they now have charging stations for your camera batteries, cell phones, of the like, and uh, of course umbrellas and bean bags for, for photographers, blankets, and, and a full kit for picnic lunches, uh, whether that's game viewing or driving between two different destinations. As you get closer to Fort Portal, the tea plantations begin, the rolling hills, they seem to grow anything and everything, but it's just a, it's a verdant um, shade of, of more more shades of green than you can possibly imagine. It's absolutely spectacular, these manicured uh, green tea plantations rolling along toward the mountains. As I said, people, very beautiful, beautiful smiles, very welcoming. This is a typical scene you'll see coming through a village, local kids waving and, and, and giving you a beautiful smile. So getting to Kabali, this is where we recommend for uh, your clients, generally speaking, to chimp trek. Very high success rate. Um, it's generally flat, um, and it's a it's a great experience. It's home to many other primate species, thirteen in, in total. You can also do a full day chimp habituation experience for those that are really really um, into primates that want to have uh, the experience of waking up with the chimps five thirty six in the morning, spending the entire day with them until they actually build their nest and go to sleep in the evening. Basically, you are you are experiencing what the original researchers experienced when they habituated the chimps 20 some odd years ago. Also a great cultural experience with lunch at uh, Tinka, a local community leader's home in the area. Chimp trekking in, in, in Kabali is generally easier and better success rate than in um, Chambara Gorge near Queen Elizabeth National Park and Budonga Forest in, in Murchison Falls. 
National Park. Um, if you have clients that are flying into uh, Kibali, they would fly into Kasesi, which is south of Fort Portal and about an hour's drive to the accommodations near Kibali. Chimp trekking, you're either in the morning or the afternoon or both if you're doing two treks or the habituation experience. There's a very large troop of about 120 chimps that we trek to, and it really depends on where they are, of course, on, on how much activity or exertion is going to be required. Anywhere from, we actually got out of our vehicle and in, in five minutes we were uh, right below the, um, the alpha male of this troop who was high up in the canopy of trees. And we then waited for about an hour, hour and a half until he came down to follow him to meet the rest of the troop. So it's generally speaking a three to four hour experience. And it, um, you know, you definitely want to have lots of layers, long sleeves, long pants, good hiking boots, gaiters or socks to put over your your pants because the safari ants uh, are not fun. You get ants in your pants. But remember, it really is an adventure. And it's actually good to start, I think, with chimp trekking before doing gorilla trekking uh, because it gets your clients warmed up. It gets you used to the experience um, and also really excited for what's to come later um, when you're doing the gorilla trekking. But it's definitely a warm-up experience to gorilla trekking. It's, it's, it's quite a bit easier, but still uh, a great adventure. You see chimps, generally speaking, up in the canopy, but also um, on the ground. It just depends on the time of day and whether they're feeding um, or they're beginning to, you know, get ready for their nesting in, in the evening. Bogoti Wetlands Walk is, is a community-based um, walk near um, the National Park, and it's great for birders. Also, um, white and black all of its monkeys and a variety of other primates in the area. And as I mentioned, lunch at Tinkas, he's a local prominent community leader, and he sets up a, a buffet, a traditional buffet of Ugandan um, food, and uh, it's, it's, you're, you're eating using your hands, and, and it really is a great cultural experience. Tink is a wonderful man, and is really, he's actually helped to set up the Pagodi Wetlands uh, Walk, and uh, has done a lot for the community in and around the Kabali National Park. A couple of the accommodations in the area. Nadali Lodge um, really has been the go-to upmarket lodge for many years in the Kabali area. It has a great family story uh, that's too long to tell, but it's still family-owned and operated by Aubrey and Claire. Um, it's a very homey, colonial, country inn feel to it, um, and the location is stunning with views of the Mountains of the Moon uh, on one side and a crater lake on the other. Things to note is that there is um, no electricity in the main lodge, which is very romantic and, and very atmospheric. But if you have clients that that would be a concern to them, um, that's that's an important uh, point. The food and the service was excellent, and it's about 45 minutes to Kabale to the to the park headquarters for chimp trekking, depending on the roads. There's the main house in the evening. You really feel like your house guests, not um, not just. Uh, staying at, at a hotel. You really are welcomed into the family, especially if the owner, Aubrey, and his wife, Claire, are there to welcome you. Just inside the park, closest to the park headquarters is the Primate Safari Lodge. Um, if you have clients doing multiple chimp treks uh, or they are doing the habituation experience, they want to spend a couple of days, this is the place to book. We only book the tented rooms. They're far better, in, in our opinion, than the cottages. Um, there is no air conditioning, however, and you are in the park, in the jungle, so it can be warm. This is a relatively new kid on the block, um, Dininga Lodge, located on this incredible crater lake with a view of the Mountains of the Moon beyond. It uh, is just outside Fort Portal. Tough road to get there, but when you get there, it is one of the most uniquely designed properties I've ever seen anywhere in the world. It's absolutely stunning. These were all hand-constructed log cabins by a, a, a British gentleman who saw this spot and decided he needed to build a lodge and did. It took him about uh, 10 years to get it done, but it's a stunning, stunning spot. There are eight log cabins on platforms, as you can see, strung out along the crater lake. There are a lot of stairs. They're connected by staircases and from the car park up to the main lodge, there are quite a few stairs, so something to keep in mind. Um, the cottages all overlook Crater Lake, and they have that backdrop of the, of the Renzori Mountains. Really big log cabin rooms, 
um, very comfortable, nice, nice bathrooms, probably the nice bathrooms that we saw throughout Uganda. All solar power, and they're well spaced in between the cabins. So it does, and, and the way they've been positioned, it's almost impossible to see any of the other cabins um, near you. So it does feel very private. As you can see, there's a huge veranda in front that has that view over the crater lake. Lots of activities in the, in the area. If you have clients that are active and they want to stay in a place for a couple of days, do a chimp trek one day. There are also um, treks throughout the community and toward the Renzori Mountains that you can do from Chininga. There's a crater walk around the rim of the crater. And the lake itself um, is swimmable. It's Bilzaria free and uh, it's 75-ish degrees, so it's great for swimming. Um, the main lodge has a kind of a ski lodge feel to it, very warm, especially when the fire is raging and the food is tremendous. Here's the view from all the chalets of the Crater Lake, that ash cone, and then if it weren't cloudy, you could also see the mountains of the moon beyond. All right, so heading from the Kabali area, Fort Portal, down toward Queen Elizabeth National Park. Uh, the most popular game driving or, or safari um, destination in Uganda. It's an ideal halfway point between Kabali and gorilla trekking in Bwindi. Um, it's uh, right along the Renzori Mountains, so you have these beautiful open savannas with, with foothills and the Renzoris be, beyond, really spectacular landscapes. It's, uh, the park is actually split between by the Kazinga Channel, um, so you have two sections of the park. The far south of the park uh, toward the Congo border is the Ashasha, um, the Ashasha area, known for its tree-climbing lions. And then you also have uh, the Chambura Gorge, and would, would give you options for chimp trekking as well as forest walks. So a great combination of activities, game drives, um, wildlife viewing by boats, lots and lots of options. Just a little bit of a closer view, you can see uh, the Chambura area here, the gorge down in this, in this area, and then the Mwea Peninsula and the Kazinga Channel, which connects Lake George and Lake Edward. These are where the game drives are primarily done uh, for the Queen Elizabeth National Park area, outside of the Ashasha area. This is just a little bit of a closer view of that same area. Um, the Kaseni area, well known for lion, um, for lion here, and then also this, uh, the Channel Drive area, north of the Kazinga Channel, does have leopard. It's more of a um, forested area, so it's a good habitat for leopard. Really productive drives in this area, lots of big herds of elephants, um, and it's got that typical rolling plains, East African safari, savannas feel to it. Uh, but then again, you've got these incredible landscapes beyond with the backdrop of, of the mountains. And what's really important as well is that the game viewing in Queen Elizabeth, you see very few other vehicles. It is a really intimate, really exclusive experience, not like you have in, in many of the larger safari parks in East Africa. Good Lion, as I said, in the northern part of, um, of the park, you have these big open skyscapes with uh, Ugandan cob herds. There's one tucked away into the grass. And then the Kazinga Channel. So a combination of land game viewing as well as um, private boats along the Kazinga Channel where you have huge, uh, uh, large concentrations of hippos. Something like 30,000 hippos actually are reported in, in the Kazinga Channel area. And of course, birding is tremendous. 560 spe species of birds in the in the Kazinga Channel area. Elephants, large. Um, we had a big, huge herd of elephants that we came across on our on our uh, cruise through the Kazinga Channel. It's usually about a two and a half to three hour experience, depending on the interest of the group. It can be a sundowner. Uh, it just depends. If you're really into birding, then of course you can take a, a much longer period of time because there are a tremendous amount of bird species. A lot of bachelor herds as well of buffalo. This, this poor guy, uh, I think his look says it all right there <laughs> as a bachelor buffalo. There is also the Kazinga village toward um, Lake Edward. So there is, uh, you, you're actually 
getting toward the lake and you can see the village. It's a fishing village and there's a lot of activity around that area. So some beautiful uh, photography options of the fishermen getting their nets ready. And again, just looking now at the accommodations, the Mueya Peninsula, Mueya Lodge, same owners as the Par Lodge, also built back in 1954-ish, 54 rooms, um, a wide variety of different levels of accommodation. Um, it's located up high on the ridge overlooking the Kazinga Channel, so beautiful views. It has, um, you know, a, a very um, nice restaurant located outside, so you, you've got a great view of the Kazinga Channel while you're having having lunch or dinner. I actually had a passion fruit gazpacho there that was, never heard of passion fruit gazpacho. It was actually tremendous. Located and across the Kazinga Channel in the Chambura um, village area is the Chambura Game Lodge. Eight tented suites, beautiful views overlooking the, the uh, plains, and then the edge of the Chambura Gorge has a nice swimming pool. Tented accommodations, relatively simple, but very comfortable in suite. Um, gas, hot water, the pool is a beautiful pool deck. Um, and then Volcanoes Chamber of Gorge Lodge. Um, going back to the game lodge, you are very close to the village. So you do, you will hear the call to prayer, for example, in the evening. It is, um, it is a, a Muslim uh, area, so you will hear that. You might hear some village noise. Something to keep in mind if you have clients that are concerned about being close to a village for either Chamber of Gorge Lodge or Chamber of Game Lodge they might prefer to stay in Mueya, which is inside the, the National Park. Chambura Gorge Lodge is the, by far the most market option in Queen Elizabeth National Park. Eight bandas, uh, two different styles with two different views, either the gorge or the savanna. Um, they actually very unique decor for each unit. They used recycled materials from a local coffee plantation, and roofs of uh, several of the bandas were actually uh, purchased or, or taken from local community members from larger buildings, and then volcanoes actually uh, uh, contributed a, a new roof to the area. So a nice um, community-based uh, lodge as well and uh, good use of sustainability. Just a little bit of a, a shot of the different accommodation options. As you can see Mueya Lodge over here in the park on that peninsula, and this is the Chambura area with the Game Lodge and the Gorge Lodge, which are our preferred accommodations. And heading down to Ashasha, the southern part of Queen Elizabeth, we had a chance encounter with a leopard along the road, just one of those right place, right time uh, moments in, in Africa. And uh, it was a you know, beautiful afternoon with the sun setting, not necessarily typical in Ashasha. What is typical, though, and, and what most people go to Ashasha for is, is the tree climbing lions. And there's a good chance, I think about a 75% chance that you spend a couple of nights in Ashasha that you will see the tree climbing lions. Really, really unique uh, experience. Big open plains. There's also, uh, there was when we were there in November, a, a hyena, a couple of hyena denning with about eight little young hyenas. Um, and big open plains with buffalo, um, Ugandan cob. And the Ashasha Wilderness Camp is your option uh, down there. It's a great property. One of, it really was one of my favorites. Uh, tented rooms. It is the most uh, safari feel of any other property in Uganda because it is located in the park and away from anything else. It's uh, located right on a river, um, tented accommodations, eco flush toilets, um, and hot bucket showers, and a beautiful riverside setting, very comfortable. Um, it really, it was a great uh, respite um, in many ways because it did kind of take you into that most more traditional safari tent um, experience that you get in other parts of Africa. They've recently done a soft refurbishment, um, and the food was tremendous. The service was excellent. Oftentimes, what Classic will do if you're staying uh, a night is uh, on the way out of the park is to, to do a picnic lunch um, right on the, the river that, that uh, demarcates Uganda and the Congo. So you're kind of overlooking the Congo and the river, big hippopods. Um, it's a nice spot for, for a lunch while out on a game drive. Here's a view from the front of my chalet, a little... A, little, a very large um, elephant bull came to visit. Here he is heading off across the river. So what most people are coming to Uganda for, heading down into Bwendi. It's not very far from Hichacha or even from Queen, about a two to three hour drive from Queen Elizabeth, depending on where you are, to the Bahoma area of Bwendi. So um, very easy to combine the two. 
If you do have clients that are just doing a, a fly-in to Buindi, um, there are a couple of options for flying in. Um, in. In the Bohoma region, which is the northern part of the park, um, let's get this a little bit more about the gorillas. There are approximately 400 gorillas out of about 880 some odd in Uganda, Rwanda, and the Congo. The population is actually growing in the last uh, census, so that's good news. Permits in Uganda are 600 per person per day, except during the low season when you have discounts uh, of um, 350 per, uh, per person in April, May, and November. You have the Batwa cultural experience and a lot of great um, active adventures within the National Forest as well. Looking a little bit more closely at Bwindi, the Buhoma region up here in the northern part of the park, there are currently about, there are three gorilla families open to trekking in that area. And this is where the, you have the accommodations, uh, Mahogany Springs, Sanctuaries, Gorilla Forest Camp, the Bohoma Lodge, as well as Volcanoes Windy Lodge. From here, you can trek either in Bohoma, um, and all of these lodges are walking distance to the, the beginning of the trek, um, or uh, Ruhisha is also available, which is uh, around here, about a two-hour drive in this area. So it depends on availability for permits. You, that's always, you know, one of the wild cards with Rwanda or with Uganda is the availability of permits as to where you'll be able to be trekking. Heading around the park, and this is what you have to do. You, the road drives all the way around and through here to Rushaga and Nukaringo. There is no road on this side. There's two options, basically, a five to seven, eight-hour drive around to Rushaga or Nukaringo or you can do a trek through the park of uh, four to seven hours. Um, Rushaga is um, where I did our trekking a couple, of month, uh, a couple of weeks ago. There are about five gorilla families open to trekking there, so a few more availability of permits in that area. And Nukaringo is one, um, has one family, and that's where the Clouds Lodge is located. So the trekking experience, this is just a little bit of a zoom in here of uh, Oh, and, and properties for Rushaga, there's the Gorilla Safari Lodge, which I, we stayed at. It's a great mid-range property. And then this new one, Chameleon Hill, which I'll talk a little bit about. Trekking in for gorillas in Windy, um, a couple of important tips. It's definitely an adventure. It can be from one to six hours long, so strong hiking boots are critical uh, with ankle support and good treads. One of the best recommendations Lindsay gave, bring gardening gloves um, and gaiters. And, uh, that or, again, long socks that can, that can go up over your pants because those safari ants are brutal. Long sleeves uh, and long pants are, of course, critical. Waterproof jacket, um, muted colors. Bring layers because it could be cool in the morning. You are at altitude. And then, of course, you're going to be getting um, you know, warm with, with the activity. Picnic lunches are provided, and again, this could be up to a six-hour adventure. Lots of water. Advise your clients to bring high-energy snacks in a day pack. And, of course, you want to have lots of Ziploc bags or waterproof bags for your camera equipment because you are in a rainforest, and it can rain, you know, just about at any time. No flash photography. Um, and we do recommend that clients, whether they really need it or not, um, uh, hire a porter. It's, uh, it's a helping to contribute to the local economy, and you actually develop a little bit of a, of a bond with your porter, uh, and they do actually provide quite a bit of assistance, whether you're a you know, 25-year-old super fit mountain climber or not. Um, it's something that Classic generally um, encourages all of their, their clients to do. There is no guarantee that you're going to see gorillas, um, but uh, it is highly unlikely that you that most packs actually do. It's, it's unlikely in most of these areas that gorillas are not found. They, um, the trackers head out early in the morning to find the gorilla families, and the groups uh, of eight trekkers follow a few hours later. A view from the Rushaga side, you can see the Virunga volcanoes as you're walking through the forest. It is very dense forest. There are nicely maintained trails that you begin on, and then depending on where the gorillas are, you head off uh, uh, bushwhacking into the forest, and this is, of course, the ultimate goal to find the gorilla families. And it really is an incredibly spiritual experience. Um, you do get quite close. Uh, eight, eight meters is the 
the distance that you're supposed to stay away from the gorilla families. But again, these are wild animals, uh, and they have been habituated, so they, they really um, can test those limits, especially little babies. We had a, a small a small little uh, guy would, would come running at our group, um, pounding his chest and trying to act all tough and then stop and stare at us from about you know five feet away as we're scrambling to, to back up. And, uh, and then he would turn around and roll down the hill. It was, it was just like a little kid. It really was uh, very, very fun and, um, and, like I said, spiritual experience to, to be there with, with the gorillas and to be that close to, uh, to the wild animals. And, of course, the silverback is what most people want to see, the big, a beautiful shot of a, of a silverback. Love the afro of this little guy. Culturally, the Batwa experience, um, it, this can be done in the, in the Buhoma area. The Batwa were the original human inhabitants of Buindi, and they were evicted in 92 when the park was created. And you can spend four to five hours learning about their lives, actually trekking through the forest to see some of their traditional homes. You're not in the national park, you're right on the edge, but it's the same um, ecosystem and the same forest, uh, same flora and fauna. And a couple of options for, for, for properties. Near the, um, on the Bahoma side, um, all of these are walkable to the park entrance and to the trek, beginning of the treks. The Mahogany Springs Lodge, one of our favorite mid-level accommodations. It's seven cottages. Um, it's a great value and a good mid-level property. Um, there are adobe chalets with thatch uh, roofs, and they have a beautiful view of the forest as well as the namesake mahogany tree, which, as you can see, is shaped uh, like Africa. Interior of those chalets, very comfortable. Not, not being over the top, but, but very nice and comfortable. Gorilla Forest Camp, um, probably the most luxurious option in the, in the Bahama area. Eight uh, tents right inside the park gate. Great service, and the views of the forest are beautiful as well. You can see a nice fire pit right in front of the main lodge. And then heading around the park uh, to the Ruchaga Nukaringo area, you can either do that seven to eight hour drive, or you can do a couple of different trails that are that are anywhere from four to um, to eight hours in length. And and uh, Lindsay can talk more about that if you have questions. She actually was able to do that on one of her last trips there, and it was it was a longer trek than they had anticipated apparently. Um, but uh, there was some miscommunication. But an absolutely beautiful. Um, experience and you really get to, to get inside of the forest and see some of the different micro um, climates that exist there. Cloud Lodge, um, very well known of course, um, eight cottages, views of the Virunga volcanoes and it's a great partnership with USAID, um, the AWF and the International Gorilla Conservation Program. Beautiful property, full of light, all of the cottages have, um, have uh, fireplaces, and uh, your own personal butler. It's the highest lodge in Uganda, and you have incredible views of the volcanoes beyond, looking uh, to the west. And it also is walkable to the start of the Nukaringo um, trek. So if you're staying in clouds, you're either going to walk to Nukaringo, or it's about a 45-minute drive um, back toward the Rushaga area. Brand new, um, Chameleon Hill Lodge. I just stayed there and uh, absolutely loved it. It's about an hour from Nukaringo and Rushaga, um, just south of Windy. And as you can see, very unique style. Um, it's uh, modern, very colorful. It has a very warm feel to it. The chalets, there are 10 of them. They're all decorated uniquely with views overlooking um, Lake Mutanda and the Burunga volcanoes. I didn't think that there could be a better view than clouds, but the Chameleon Hill Lodge actually um, surpassed it. Here's the main lodge. Um, and it all overlooks a huge veranda and deck overlooking the, uh, the lake, Lake Mutanda there, and the volcanoes beyond. Absolutely spectacular spot. Nice thing as well, um, or, or one of the factors with, with Chameleon Hill is there's a lot of cultural activities available as well, going on a canoe, full-day canoe trip on the lake to visit some of the islands where there are small villages, meeting local fishermen, um, going to on a coffee plantation tour in the area. So. If you have clients that are active or really interested in culture and that have a few more days to, to spend, um, I would say Chameleon Hill is a great option 
uh, for those. And, and the cottages are a little bit small, certainly a lot smaller than clouds, but they all have this incredible view and, and, and are very, very comfortable. And then close to Ruchaga, walking distance to the Ruchaga trekking gate is the Gorilla Safari Lodge, also relatively new, a couple of years old, great mid-range um, property, great food and great service, um, very, you know, simple rooms, but, uh, but an excellent option for your mid-range packs that are uh, staying near Rushing, uh, Rushaga or um, that are trekking in Nukaringo. So we're going to finish up here um, and talk a little bit about flying in Uganda and connecting some of the, the circuit with flights. Um, so I'll start off by saying that oftentimes now we're recommending the clients, instead of doing the drive back from Wendy to Entebbe with the stop in Lake Amburo, which is a great experience unto itself, but it does require two full days. That drive is a long um, six-hour per day drive and does require that stop in Lake Amburo. Clients can actually easily fly then from Wendy to Entebbe, uh, a couple of hour flights at the most. And in many cases, it's actually cheaper because you're taking a, a flight and you're not having that overnight and the cost of that with uh, staying at Mahingo Lodge in Lake Amburo. And, and while there is a circuit of flights, um, Classic doesn't utilize all of those legs and really all of them have to hub and spoke through the Entebbe um, airport, the Entebbe area. Um, packs can fly into the Bahoma area lodges if you're staying in at Gorilla Forest Camp or Mahogany Springs. Kihigi Airstrip is north of Bahoma, about a uh, 45 minutes, 30 minute uh, drive. From those going to Clouds or Chameleon Hill um, and, and staying or trekking in Nukaringo or Ushaga, it's about an hour and a half drive from Kisora where the flights land, so keep, keep that in mind. And that's where packs would generally, if they're doing um, a flying back to Entebbe, you would fly out of either Kisora or Kihihi. And you can fly into Mercers and Falls, but we always send a vehicle. Um, we, we deadhead a vehicle that meets you up, and then you continue your journey from Murchison in the vehicle down to the Kabali area. Um, the other option, of course, if you're going to go up to um, Kadepo and to the beautiful Apoka Lodge, flights are really pretty much the, the option. You can drive, but it's, it's a two-day trip. Uh, and again, um, you can be guided there with the Apoka vehicles, um, which is a little different than a Murchison. We will, um, PAX can stay and, and just do a self-contained safari from Apoka. Or you can fly in and then have a, a classic vehicle meet you and drive and continue the, the journey to Murchison and then onward on the circuit. As I said, it's oftentimes cheaper to fly back to Entebbe from the Bwindi area than, uh, than doing a stopover in Lake Mburo for an overnight. But we're at right about an hour and I'm a little longer than I wanted to, so I'm going to open things up. If you want to start asking questions, I see there are some now. I'm going to just fly through Lake Mburo real quick because it, it is something that, uh, that is, there are some great um, reasons just to experience that area unto itself. It's a very small, one of the smallest, if not the smallest national park in Uganda, um, but it offers a lot packed into a small little place. Boat trips on the lake. You can do game drives, including night drives, which is not, which is now available sort of in Queen Elizabeth and Murchison, but it requires utilizing um, a um, a national park vehicle and not our own vehicle. So it's not something that we typically recommend. But in Lake Amburo, you can actually utilize the classic vehicles and do night drives. It's the only place in Uganda for impala and zebra, lots of other antelope, unique antelope species. And then you have also walking and horseback riding safaris. So again, for an active itinerary, it's really a must. And, uh, and for those that want to have a few more options of seeing game, it's really a, it's really a great option. Um, it is a six-hour drive from Bwindi to get to Lake Amburo. Uh, and then another five to six hour drive back to Entebbe. So it, it is two, you know, it's bookend by two full days. Um, but again, a lot of good reasons to spend some time there. And one of them, maybe the principal one beyond the game viewing and the activities is Mahingo Lodge. Beautiful property up on a, a hill overlooking a uh, beautiful water hole and it's got a really nice tented feel to it. I'm not going to go really go into Kadepo Valley, although it's an incredible um, place, but it's something that uh, it's for the multi-time Africa traveler, the person that really wants to get off the map. And again, it does require a lot of logistical management, whether it's flights or 
uh, deadheading vehicles. Um, one of the few places that you can see cheetah, and um, there are massive open plains, and you really will not uh, find any other people there. And of course, Apoka Lodge is, uh, is a spectacular property as well. So I appreciate all of your attention for a little bit over an hour. I hope this was a helpful uh, blitz through Uganda. I'm going to go ahead and look at the questions here and, uh, and try to answer a few of them. And again, if I don't get to all of them, uh, I will answer via email. We're also going to be archiving this if, um, if you want to refer to it later, share it with your office, um, whatever you may want to do. Um, we will have it archived on our website, kusinicollection.com backslash multimedia, and I will send out a link to this uh, later, well, probably tomorrow, in our weekly email. You can look for that. Uh, so a question here about Classic handling uh, the ground operations themselves. Um, yes, they do handle, as I said, uh, they, like, for example, in Merciston Falls, if, you have, if we have clients flying in there, um, we will send our own vehicle because we do not want to subcontract to um, other ground operators in the Murchison Falls area or to the properties in that area. Um, we really believe in the quality of our guides and our vehicles and the classic experience. So um, absolutely, the answer is uh, we do not subcontract in, in Uganda. Um, we're utilizing our own vehicles and our own guides. The only exceptions to that would be, as I said, in Kadepo with Apoka Lodge, or if we have clients um, doing just uh, a fly-in to Wendy, for example, uh, and they're just doing guerrilla trekking, then generally speaking, then we would uh, work directly with the lodge, um, who would pick them up at the airport, and uh, they would do their treks and then return with, uh, with the vehicle from the property. Um, good question uh, regarding the availability of permits. There are a limited number of permits in each guerrilla trekking region. Um, and so uh, there aren't always enough permits. Say if you're staying in Buhoma, uh, there may the permits for the day that you want to trek may in fact be, be sold out. So you'll need to go um, to the, the Riha area to trek. And that means that's an hour and a half, two hour drive, which isn't ideal if you're staying in Buhoma and there are trekking options or there is a trekking um, a family for trekking right there in Buhoma, but that's just the luck of the timing. So same thing in Nukaringo and Rushaga, although those are much closer um, with the, the available properties. If the permits are sold out in Nukaringo, there's only one gorilla family, so they tend to be more um, harder to get in that area. Then you may, if you're staying in clouds, you may have to go to Rushaga to trek for the gorillas. So it just it just depends on the availability for that particular day, and there needs to be some flexibility. But Classic always, you know, attempts to work, um, well, always works your guerrilla trekking itinerary around the available permits in terms of recommending a property that will work. So there's no way that you would uh, have clients that would stay at Clouds, for example, and would be told, oh, you have to go trek in Bahoma. Um, obviously, that's not going to happen. Uh, let's see. Uh, Classic only does FIT. Um, Candice, they don't actually have set departures. Um, we do um, almost exclusively, um, well, we do exclusively FIT um, departures as well as we'll set up a group for you. If you have a larger group, a museum group, or a university group, or a large group of family and friends that are traveling together, um, we can handle, you know, larger groups. Usually, you know, the vehicle seats up to seven, so, you know, 14, uh, if you're doing two vehicles, would probably be our, you know, our ideal maximum, but we do have enough vehicles to handle larger groups, but we are all FIT. Um, we do not have set departures. Standard length of the circuit, um, you know, you can do um, a six-day trip, um, but ideally you're looking at eight days. If you're going to, if you're doing Kabali, Queen Elizabeth National Park, and Wendy um, and maybe Lake Amburo at the end, you can do that in eight to 10 days. If you're adding Murchison Falls, really a 10-day itinerary is ideal, and, and uh, Kadepo and, and beyond, you're looking at, at two weeks. But the classic circuit um, that includes Kabali, um, Queen Elizabeth National Park, and Wendy, um, six to eight days would be ideal. And then you can do a, a four-day fly-in to 
um, windy as well to just do gorilla trekking. Let's see here. Okay, I think it's all the questions I'm seeing. Uh, if I get any others, I will um, absolutely send them out by email. And you can always email me or Lindsay uh, at tad at cusinicollection.com or lindsay at cusinicollection.com. And again, I will send this out uh, via email tomorrow and it will be posted on our website. Really appreciate the time and your attention for what is now approaching an hour and 10 minutes. I know that you're all busy and I hope that you've enjoyed this blitz tour of Uganda and that, uh, that we can work with you in the future on, on developing itineraries to this spectacular and, and really unique destination that, that does tick a uh, all of the safari buckets uh, for game viewing um, and obviously the, the chimp uh, and gorilla experience is incredible. But the landscapes and the cultural opportunities really are what set Uganda apart as a unique safari destination. And uh, I hope that we'll be able to work with you to send many more clients to experience uh, the country. Thanks very much. Have a great Thursday. And I appreciate your time and attention.